Let's start, however, in the tech world, where IBM will officially open its 12th global research laboratory in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, next week. Now, this will be the first science and technology research facility of its kind in Africa. The president of IBM Research in Kenya is expected to encourage and strengthen a culture of innovation in tech while encouraging local entrepreneurs and innovators to develop targeted solutions to the economic challenges faced by East Africa's residents and those of other fast-growing economies around the world. The project is a partnership between the Catholic University of East Africa, the Kenyan government and IBM. Elsewhere, Nigeria is decrying the fact that the country imports up to 95% of the milk consumed in that country and it intends to support its Cattle Breeders Association in efforts to boost milk output. Kaduna State Governor Mukhtar Amalaniero lamented the fact that milk output is quite low despite the presence of some 16 million cows in the country. He said there are lots of firms interested in investing in Nigeria's dairy industry. In his remarks, the Agriculture Minister Akinomi Adesina said that the Ministry has selected Kaduna to strengthen pioneering efforts in the use of milk cooperative societies to transform Nigeria's dairy sector. Global investors are already jockeying for position in the sector, as evidenced by the changing hands of Fan Milk International, a frozen dairy product and juices maker in West Africa, which also operates in Nigeria. Of course, barely 24 hours ago, Danone, the world's biggest yogurt maker, joined a Braj group in a deal that will see the two acquire Fan Milk International, a Ghanaian producer of frozen dairy products and juices with a presence right across West Africa, not just in Nigeria. It's also in Côte d'Ivoire, Benin, Burkina Faso and Togo. Its size aside, however, that deal is similar to a wave of other acquisitions elsewhere in Africa. The Dubai-based private equity firm alone has invested over $2 billion in well over 70 companies across Africa. Last year, Danone itself paid half a billion euros to acquire Morocco's top dairy firm. Now, to examine the spread of such deals across the continents, let's head over to London, where CCTV's Melanie Ralph is standing by. She's been keeping a close eye on the M&A action across the continent in this sector. Melanie, given the uncertainty, really, about the end of easy money, how many more deals of this sort are we likely to see across Africa, particularly with respect to agriculture? Well, that's a good question, Rama. When the tapering begins, emerging economies will see an impact. The drying up of easy money is likely to weigh on deals like Danone, but also larger infrastructure investments. That being said, when it comes to expansion, Africa should certainly not be ignored by companies wanting to tap into other markets. With over one billion inhabitants and a growing middle class, there's money to be made. Consumption is going to grow and no doubt gross domestic product. But with the liquidity tap turned off, you might see investments slowing down. But how then are attractive, uh, or rather how attractive really are companies in Africa to firms looking for M&A opportunities across the continent? Well, in the agriculture sector, there are still a few hurdles to overcome. First and foremost is infrastructure, but also making businesses work harder. Why not make the tomato paste as well as grow the tomatoes, for example? No doubt there's still an abundance of opportunities, but African economies will have to compete more effectively, not only with among themselves, but more essentially internationally. It's a fine balancing act for, for agricultural companies because restructuring their business can entail risk and any new risk into their profiles will, in certain sectors, impact investors' investment appetite. Indeed. We'll have to keep you on the line for just a moment, however. Let's move on very briefly in this particular instance over to South Africa, where the spectre of protected labour and rest dust continue to haunt Africa's biggest economy. More so after South Africa's Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, AMCU, was given permission by a government mediator to call a strike against Impala Platinum, the world's second largest producer of the precious metal barely 24 hours ago. Now, Implet said in a statement after wage talks essentially ended up in deadlock that, and I quote, a certificate of non-resolution, which is essentially a strike certificate, has been issued. In effect, that allows AMCO to call a protected wage strike subject to a 48-hour notice period, end of quote. Now, the expected unrest and the prospect of a drawn-out standoff is expected to negatively affect the country's battered economy. AMCU has said it will canvass its members on Monday on whether or not the strike should proceed.
Now let's see how markets, of course, process the development in South Africa today. Melanie Ralph joins us once again from London. Um, Melanie, barely 15 or so days ago, um, uh, rather in this instance, Amplatz, not Amco, I apologize, was dealing with a strike that essentially saw it lose roughly $61 million worth of output. Can it really afford another strike this time? Well, actually, uh, Rama analysts on this end are saying that the losses clocked up to nearly $100 million losses of output, actually. So it certainly was a nasty hole left in the balance sheet as Implats ups the ante about a strike. Some analysts say that Amplats, too, could be uh, facing the same threat from its workers. Amcu will be canvassing, as you were saying, the Implats members on Monday to see if they do want to go ahead with the strike action. If they say yes, then 48 hours later, it will be a case of tools down and negotiations will have to start to reach a conclusion. It's thought that once a wheel has been put in motion for a strike, it's unlikely they'll back away from it. As we edge nearer to Christmas, however, there is an outside chance that some members won't want to agree to a strike. The miners have families to support and right now might not be the ideal time to be losing weeks of money. Indeed, but given the prospect of a strike, is Amplat's end-year production target of 2.3 million ounces of platinum still considered as feasible by analysts on your end? Well, the short answer to that, Rammer, is no. Analysts say more stoppages of operations will mean that Amplats won't make its output targets. A prolonged stoppage wouldn't be good news at all for the company. Implats, however, could be on a slightly better position with some analysts pointing out that the margins are better there than with Amplats. No doubt the strikes or threats of strikes are going to keep the price of the precious metal up. But of course, they won't be able to take advantage of that if they're not in operation. Indeed. We'll have to leave it there for the time being, though. Thank you very much for your feedback. That's CCTV's Melanie Ralph live in London on m and activity across Africa, especially in the agricultural sector, and quite a bit of interesting news coming out of South Africa. Now, over the last decade, Zambia's GDP growth has risen fairly steadily, from just over 5% per year to over 7% in 2012, in part due to its natural resources. That growth, however, isn't trickling down. Over half of Zambians still live well below the poverty line. Job opportunities are scarce, earnings on average are still quite low. CCTV's Julie Shire has the details from the Zambian capital, Lusaka. Zambia's economy is developing fast due to its copper mining. It accounts for 80% of foreign exchange earnings and is the largest industry that provides jobs. But the country's over-dependence in copper mining is neglecting other economic sectors and job creation. High levels of unemployment in Zambia especially among the youth, have raised concern, and the government, together with the World Bank, are seeking ways to fight unemployment. So the idea now is to say, OK, Zambia has got this huge number of young people, and the rural area is where poverty is, and yet even those who are employed are still poor. How do we make things work? At this informal forum organized by the World Bank, young Zambians are trying to find solutions for job creation. The main aspect that has really come out is the um, identification that uh, agriculture is a big factor in uh, economic growth for Zambian opportunities and job creation. Economic prospects for the future appear bright if growth can be sustained and broadened to accelerate job creation and reduce poverty. Zambians are beginning to realize that much of the solution may lie within the agriculture sector. Julie Shire, CCTV, in Lusaka, Zambia. And just about a quarter to the top of the hour, we're taking a short break. Here's what's coming up next. Ethiopia will be building Africa's biggest geothermal power plant with $4 billion of private money. The details are coming up next. Asia. Asia means business.
Welcome back. Ethiopia has signed a preliminary $4 billion deal with an Icelandic firm which aims to bring the country's vast geothermal power resources to market. Reykjavik Geothermal, which, whose Icelandic geothermal expertise is backed by American investors, signed a deal to construct a one gigawatt geothermal power plant in the volcanically active Rift Valley. Now, once complete, that will be the biggest power plant of that kind in Africa, and it should essentially boost Ethiopia's ambitions of becoming a major electricity exporter in East Africa. Once complete, the project will be Ethiopia's biggest FDI program run by its first privately owned utility. Ethiopia is currently suffering from frequent blackouts. The country will raise its installed generation capacity from 2 gigawatts at present to about 10 gigawatts in the next three years. The bulk of that will be coming from the 6 gigawatt Grand Renaissance Dam, which is currently under construction on the Nile. Still in matters to do with Ethiopia, that country and China have signed a letter of intent where China will keep supporting Ethiopia's agricultural sector by enhancing techn technical and, of course, a few other vocational training elements as well. The agreement will also enable the East African state to acquire the means to effectively utilize its vast and as yet untapped bamboo resources. Here's Peter Okaba with more. As part of government-to-government -government cooperation visiting Chinese Agriculture Minister Hang Chanfu and his Ethiopian counterpart Tefere Debu have signed a letter of intent to support Ethiopia's agriculture development program. The Ethiopian Agriculture Minister said the agreement aims to strengthen China's technical and training support in four regions of the country. We signed a letter of intent which will gradually uh, be developed into a uh, memorandum of understanding between the two uh, ministries. We agreed to organize uh, as a modality a working group uh, which is uh, formed from the two uh, ministries so that the agreement can be executed and implemented. China has been offering technical and vocational training to Ethiopian agricultural experts for 10 years now. Currently, more than 30 Chinese agricultural experts are engaged in the transfer of skills and knowledge to their Ethiopian counterparts. The Chinese experts have been successful in training college students specializing in plant and animal science in demonstration sites and were instrumental in setting up the Alagai Technical Vocational and Education Training College for silkworm development. The East African nation is also making use of China's experts to tap its rich bamboo resource. Uh, uh, we are, we are uh, given the, 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 the opportunity to establish this uh, training center and we are working with our uh, Chinese uh, uh, partners to, to, to establish uh, this center. Uh, we'd like to uh, get uh, different experience, uh, knowledge, skill from our uh, Chinese partners through visit exchange training uh, uh, programs. Uh, and we'd like to capitalize uh, on the ongoing uh, adaptation trials. For example, we have Pearl Millet, a hybrid one, uh, which, is, which we are trying to adapt in, 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 into Ethiopia. Within the framework of South-South Cooperation, a new and huge demonstration site and training center are nearing completion in the western parts of the country. The center is expected to start operation in two weeks' time, and is designed to serve other bamboo-rich African nations. Peter Kaba, CCTV. A three-day symposium in the Zimbabwean capital, Harare, seeking ways to explore w in ways in which African economies can capitalize on growing economic and diplomatic ties with China. Now, the country is Sub-Saharan Africa's biggest trading partner, but most African economies aren't growing at the same pace as the Asian giant. Uh, CCTV's Farai Moktuya now reports, uh, answering why was a big focus. China's sustained economic growth is being fueled by resources from Africa. The volume of trade is estimated to be close to $2 billion. Africa enjoys a surplus, but many of its citizens are yet to feel it. Participants at the China-Africa Symposium blame this on the balkanization of the continent under colonialists that left many countries nationalist in view as opposed to pan-Africanist. It is here that Africa can borrow a leaf from the Chinese success story. We learn from the Chinese that it is important to integrate and it is important to join together these different regions. And I think uh, the fact that the current uh, approach is not helping us is going to force us to face the real reality. The opportunities abound for Africa. Access to cheaper inputs and better technology, 
greater demand for its resources and increasing global commodity prices which can boost export revenues. China's continuing investment in Africa, which is now more than $40 billion, has also given Africa a newfound allure. The vibrance of China as a, as a market for African resources is the one which has driven us to where we are now to become recognized by European fund managers, by Western banks, by even you know, you know, the traditional commercial banks in Europe. They all now want to deal with Africa. Low-priced Chinese imports could put many manufacturers and domestic markets out of business, a threat which can be averted by coming up with conducive policies. Africa, which still lacks, uh, uh, the, the, which still not focusing on trying to develop uh, its, its, its infant industries, therefore costs in Africa are high. Therefore, the price in Africa tend to be high. This meeting was a candid and honest self-assessment on both sides to address the nature of the relationship and most importantly chart the way forward. Both Africa and China are inextricably linked and the key here was to find out how they can mutually benefit from this strategic partnership. Farai Makutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Now, the 15th edition of the Abuja Auto Fair is underway in the Nigerian capital. The event provided a platform for car makers from across the world to showcase the latest designs for the local market. Now, buyers at the fair, however, expressed quite a bit of concern that the cost of the cars in question are a bit too high. And also, despite the warranties on offer, they were equally concerned about after sales service and the availability of support. We have very, very um, affordable and very efficient after-sales network in Nigeria. Apart from the CFA um, models, which have three main branches in Nigeria, we have authorized dealers in about 13 or 16 states of the Federation as of today who can effectively manage and cope with any after-sales um, um, after issue on the travel vehicle. This over here is the 2013 uh, Kia Optima. It's a 2.0 litre engine and it's also available in 2.4 litre. Now how much is this? This is uh, going for 4.5 but right now we're doing a promotion uh, for the fair for 4.27. As a matter of fact, in Lagos we run 24 hours uh, uh, claim payment. But here in Abuja we could guarantee you that as soon as you have the proper documentation of the claim, within a week we indemnify you. Right. Now, as far as the markets are concerned, really, it was a case of locking whatever gains you had seen earlier in the week, as you're just about to see the All Share Index in Nigeria, ending the day in the red by just about half a percentage point. The All Share Index in South Africa, really, providing only gains we're seeing on the board so far, but at best marginal ones. It had, of course, a run of record highs earlier in the week. And the 20 Share Index in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, also still remaining relatively shy of that 49.15 mark, down 0.27. The Egyptian market, of course, today being a Friday, is close. That's a business for you this week. On to the sport now with Famida. Thanks very much, Rama. That's right. We've got sport coming up, but just after this break, including.